Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am here to do a session about the web security model. And the goal is in this session to tell you a bit about the client side security policies in the web. So what is a cornerstone security policy? How does it work? How can you leverage it, leverage it to build secure applications? Uh, first, a short introduction. I'm Philippe de Rijk. I'm a final year PhD student here at KU Leuven. Uh, and I'm uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Jo, for the opportunity to come talk about my work. Um, thank you, Levin, then. <laughs> my research focuses on cross-site request forgery and session management, uh, two important areas in uh, modern web security. And I'm the author of Ceasefire, a browser add-on uh, protecting, uh, protecting against CSERF, which has been presented here, I think, a few years ago. Um, I also, I'm also a contributor to the Struis project, uh, where we made a deliverable, which is basically a web platform guide about the current state of the security of the web. And it's a broad overview um, of the, the modern web, the assets that there are available, the capabilities an attacker has. And based on that, we uh, list a whole set of threats and uh, potential attacks, um, along with their countermeasures and best practices to protect, protect, protect against them. Okay, so in this talk, I will um, work with some, some examples. I have an aptly named example.com application, which has several uh, parts that, that are important or need to be taken into account. First, you have a public, public part where you have some public information. Um, every website has that. You have an account management part where you, have, um, you need to log in securely, um, things like that. You have a private customer area. Again, a sensitive part where only your customers are supposed to be, um, where you definitely don't want anything to go wrong. And you have a public forum, which, is, um, which has different properties because it's publicly accessible, it has public content, but still you don't want um, common web attacks to happen there, but it's definitely less sensitive than the other parts of the application. So you want, maybe you want some kind of separation in between. Then you have some analytics code, which is present on almost every website today. Um, we want to integrate some location information and some Twitter integration as well, where you have some, a gadget of Twitter. And all of this, doesn't sound too complicated. So how, how, would we, how would we do it? Let's say we have a browser on the left and the backend on the right. We have some components that are deployed in the backend. Here we have the private uh, customer area, you have the public forum, they use a shared backend, sounds reasonable. You deploy it, well, you deploy it and it's loaded by a web browser. So he loads some page content um, from the private area. It loads the external components that are integrated there. And you expect that there's some kind of isolation available, like, okay, this is loaded in the browser, but not much can go wrong. Um, this, these components are loaded, but you suspect, okay, it's a gadget I integrate, so it's probably isolated somehow. It can't, uh, can't do much wrong. Similarly, you have the public forum. It's loaded in the browser. It should be separate from the rest. And um, even if there is a, a, another tab open or another window open with some malicious website, you hope it cannot uh, influence your website. But unfortunately, if that was the case, I wouldn't be here and uh, everything would be solved. So I'm going to show you step by step what does happen in a browser and why this is a problem. And then in a the second part, we'll go look at solutions on how to address these problems. So first of all, if you host these on your uh, traditional example.com uh, domain, if you don't take any separation into account, then these things are not isolated. So they're definitely um, joined together. So if you have a problem on the forum, uh, your private customer area will suffer from it. Definitely not what you want. Um, these policies um, depend on the origin. So uh, everything hosted under, under this origin will be the same and it will have access to everything in your website. So that's definitely something you want to avoid. Second, the external code, if you include it the way it's often included today, then there is no isolation. So you include a script from Twitter and you have this nice Twitter box, everything seems right, but in practice there is absolutely no isolation. So the Twitter content has full access to the page you loaded here. And even worse, it has access to your locally stored data. It has access to the permissions that are associated with your domain. It has access to uh, APIs that can make requests to your backend with uh, you not being able to distinguish these requests from legitimate requests. So again, no boundaries, which is problematic. A third problem is that the scripts that you include typically come from a remote host. So you have some uh, code hosted by Twitter. You have some code hosted by Google and you include it. Uh, not per se a problem, but by doing so, you kind of trust Google or Twitter to do the right thing. Well, they probably do the right thing, but you also trust them to not be vulnerable against attacks because if an attacker can inject uh, code here, it's loaded in your website and you become vulnerable. 
And to illustrate this, um, I have uh, a few examples. Here you have a Qtip tool library. It's a jQuery plugin. Uh, you can download it from the website and apparently at the end of 2011 uh, the code was compromised on the repository itself. So everybody who downloaded it in the period of 32 days, between these two dates, uh, downloaded the library including some malware. So you include that in your website, everything works fine, but in the background um, you actually loaded malware which started connecting to uh, weird servers on the internet. And this was discovered by bug reports of users saying like, okay, I've included this but now I'm making requests to some weird IP, what the hell is happening? Um, so, things like this can go wrong. Imagine that you didn't have to download this, but include it directly in your website, then um, one compromise of one code library and you're instantly uh, compromised as well. A second example, uh, colleagues of mine did a large-scale study of uh, the top 10,000 Alexa domains, basically the, the 10,000 most popular sites uh, on the internet, and they looked at how many scripts are included, uh, how large is this problem, is this a problem or not. And uh, well, you can derive it from the logos here, this is probably a problem. And 88.45% of these sites actually includes remote scripts. So 88.45% um, of the sites trust a remote host to be not compromised when they include scripts. Um, here's a histogram plotting the, the use of remote script hosts. So here this is the percentage of sites. And here, um, the incremental number of remote hosts that they trust to include scripts from. So you see, here in the beginning, that about 70% of the sites use between 0 and 20 different remote hosts to include scripts from, which is already quite a lot of dependencies on uh, external service providers to do uh, the right thing, to provide correct code, to not be compromised. And one site managed to even include scripts from 295 different remote hosts. So, um, Definitely not recommend using that site if you are a bit security conscious. Additionally, they defined some measurements to see whether um, a site is security conscious or not, whether they uh, apply clean, clean technologies, whether they um, configure their uh, technologies that they deploy securely. And based on those numbers, um, they concluded that 12% of the sites that do the right thing, that take extra measures to make things secure, do include scripts from hosts that do not take these measures. So, um, these 12% of sites are basically very vulnerable um, by compromise through an external script provider. So this is definitely a problem um, in the web today and it's definitely not a solved problem. Okay, back to the example. Um, a next step is we probably want some secure connection for our open website. Uh, seems reasonable. You, uh, after all, you have authentication information, you have login credentials, you have session cookies, so you deploy HTTPS, standard practice. Doing so also means that if you include remote code, that you need to do it over HTTPS as well. Otherwise, you get mixed content, and mixed content leaves you vulnerable for network attackers. Um, again, other colleagues did uh, another large-scale study of the top 100,000 100, domains, and they discovered um, 18,500 and something uh, HTTPS websites. Of these, 43% are vulnerable to remote co uh, mixed content inclusion. So 43% of these websites include content from an HTTP uh, URL, which is vulnerable for network attacks. And in 27% of cases, this could lead to arbitrary JavaScript inclusion. So even if you do the right thing, you take all these measures, you deploy HTTPS, you protect against these attacks, including one library and with an attacker in the wrong place, and you're, again, um, effort for nothing. You're compromised. So, um, a final problem uh, in the web today is that even though there is some isolation at the client side uh, enforced by the same origin policy, for instance, where the attacker cannot directly access your website, um, nothing prevents the attacker from making requests to your backend. This is how the web works. This is how you include an image from some other site in your website. That's this request. But since you have cookies here, um, the browser happily attaches these cookies to the other requests as well. And then you have an attack called cross-site request forgery, which you probably heard of. Uh, Jim mentioned it yesterday in his talk. CSERF, or cross-site request forgery in uh, full, um, happens everywhere. Facebook has it, Google has it. Of course, they fix it fairly uh, quick, but um, other sites have it as well. You have change email forms where you can change the mail address for your account with CSERF. So an attacker can change your mail address and then reset your password and take control of your account. Your home router is probably vulnerable to CSERF. These devices are notoriously insecure um, because, yeah, who's going to hack you from inside your own network? But visit the website, and the website tries to change the DNS servers on your home, on your home device. If it's vulnerable to CSERF, it succeeds. 
and your DNS servers are changed to the attacker ones and he has control over all your websites you visit. So again, this is an important problem. Um, there is protection against it, but you have to know about it to build it in. And once you build it in, then the problem is fixed. But today in the web, it isn't fixed. So that's what you're here to, to learn today. So what do we want? Um, this is the application what we do want. We want our client-side components to be isolated from each other, especially if they have a different sensitivity. For instance, a forum is less sensitive than the rest. Okay, isolate it. Don't let them influence each other. We want um, secure connections to be used, and we want them to be used for the other content as well. Um, we want the external code integrated <coughs> in our pages to be isolated or at least restricted. We want to be able to say you can do this and this, but not nothing else. Uh, we don't want you sniffing around in our local storage facilities or whatever. And we want potentially malicious contexts. Uh, when they make requests, we don't want to, to influence the backend. So we want to, well, we can't prevent them from making them, but we <coughs> at least can detect them and say like, okay, this is definitely um, not something we want. So we're going to prevent this or ignore this. And we're going to tackle these problems step by step. So the first uh, challenge we're going to tackle is compartmentalization. So we are going to uh, see how we can leverage the same origin policy, which is a security policy, the cornerstone security policy of the web, which has been there since 95, I think. We're going to see how we can leverage this to eff effectively isolate components, how we can separate them within the browser. Of course, if you separate them, you need to share some stuff. Uh, we want to share uh, authentication and information. So we don't want the user to have to re-log in on every part of our website. So we want some uh, way to share the authentication among the website and also share some information. If we want to request some account information from another part of the site, we want to be able to do that. We want to use the third party code. We want to do analytics and Twitter and everything uh, associated. But we don't want mixed content warnings, so um, we'll have to solve that or address that in some way. And we want to be able to manage the risks associated with the code. We want to either trust a trustworthy uh, provider. For instance, if you include something from Google, if you're aware that this is a risk, but it's a risk you're willing to take, then that's fine. But uh, if you don't want to include code from some shady website somewhere on the web, so there are solutions you can apply there. And finally, um, we're going to see some communication uh, mechanisms for the backend. So how can you send requests back and forth? Um, you can do this from HTML and from JavaScript, um, but you still need to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate requests. So um, that's a lot of challenges to solve. So we're going to dive right in with the first one, compartmentalization. So an origin, um, probably all of you know this, but to refresh it up, um, consists of the triple scheme, host, and port, which are taken from the URL. So for this URL, the, the origin is HTTP for the scheme, example.org for the uh, domain, and 80 for the port, which is implicit here. Um, but for HTTP, the port is 80. The same origin policy is based on these origins. Um, maybe you know the same origin policy as the thing in the browser that says, uh, gives you an error when you try to do something uh, that violates it. Um, that's possible. It's, you see it as DOM exceptions or explicit same origin policy exceptions. But what it basically says is that if you have content that comes from one origin, you can interact with other content from that origin. So if you include, for instance, an iframe from the same origin, you can interact with it. You can access it, you can modify it, uh, you can do whatever you want. But if it comes from another origin, then it's restricted. Um, this is important because otherwise you could include an iframe, access it, inspect it, ex extract a password from it, uh, things like that. So <coughs> that's definitely not something we want. and that's. This policy came into life when JavaScript was introduced in the browser because all of a sudden you could interact with uh, other documents, you could uh, extract elements, uh, listen to input fields, uh, things like that. So therefore we restrict these interactions. So how can you use this? Um, this is enforced in the browser, it's present in every browser. There may be some quirks here and there, but um, in most modern browsers these are resolved and everybody enforces the same policy. And it allows you to separate sensitive parts from non-sensitive parts if you put them in different origins. So you have these, this policy that separates them. Well, use the origins to uh, effective, effectively um, separate them. It can prevent the, the unintended sharing of information. So if you have separate origins, then uh, information will not be shared unless you want it to. And it also prevents escalation of an attack. If your forum is compromised, um, since the other part of the site lives in a different origin, then it won't be that easy to compromise the other parts as well. So a small example. Here we have um, the, the forum part, which includes an iframe from the pri private customer part. Um, in this case, they have both, the both have the same origin. 
So they can freely interact. Uh, that's potentially a problem. Additionally, let's say that the private part uses uh, a data store in the browser, for instance, IndexedDB, if you know it. It's a, a sort of a database-like uh, storage system you can use within the browser, so you can store some data there. Um, you also have web storage, which is simple key value based storage in the browser. Um, if the private part uses this, it's stored under the origin of example.com. So, which basically means that the forum site can also use this. Um, this may not be what you want. If the forum doesn't need the data, then it's not stored there. It doesn't need it. So, what would change if you do it um, like this? Here you have um, forum.example.com and private.example.com. Different domains, so um, different origins. Um, they cannot interact anymore, not freely at least. We will see later how they can interact. And if the private part stores some data, now it's stored under its own origin and there's no way for the forum to, act, to actively access this data store. So again, um, you get separation by the, from the same origin policy. So you have two choices to do this. You can either use subdomains or domains itself. Um, I'm gonna go over both options. So, Subdomains basically have the same parent domain, which is example.com here. Um, this has some advantages. It's a def different origin, so that's a good thing, but um, some relaxation mechanisms exist to make them same origin again. So uh, they can both relax their domain to the parent domain, example.com, and uh, using the document.domain property, and from then on, um, they're considered to be same origin again, and they can interact. For domains, let's say we have private.example.com and exampleforum.com, two completely different domains. Um, these cannot interact, they cannot relax, they cannot share cookies. Oh, I forgot this. Um, so with the subdomains, you can also share cookies on example.com. So you can set one cookie that applies for all subdomains. You can't do that with different domains. Um, so that's a trade-off, which one do you want to use? Um, one example of subdomains here. Let's say we have www.example.com, the private one, the foreign one, and the account. Um, in this case, nobody can interact with anybody. Um, all different domains, uh, so different origins, uh, nothing happens there. Let's say uh, two of these use the document.domain property in JavaScript, which is simple as this, um, to relax their domain. So these two want to interact. They say, okay, we assume the origin example.com, uh, and from now on they can interact. The browser allows this. Um, this seems a reasonable option to uh, achieve interaction, but this is an opt-in mechanism um, without any control. So if the forum now decides, oh, I want to relax my domain to example.com as well, um, it can also interact with these contexts. And that's maybe not what you intended. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind when deciding how to compartmentalize your application. So um, let's see, how can we compartmentalize? Um, we have the four components here. And here we, we're going to have some questions that are help, going to help us decide what to put where. So, first of all, does it have sensitive content? Um, well, the public part doesn't have sensitive content, the forum neither. I mean, it's a public forum, so no, no real uh, sensitive content there. But these parts do have sensitive content, so you probably want to separate them. Do you have authentication, which means uh, credentials, session management, uh, those kind of things? Well, the public part doesn't, but the rest does. So. Uh, this implies that there will be some sensitive data transmitted back and forth, so you probably want to deploy over HTTPS. Um, for the public part, if you have the option, of course, you deploy over HTTPS um, because you gain a lot of uh, security. But for the sake of this example, I'm not going to do it, so I can uh, talk about some interesting interactions between HTTP and HTTPS. Do you need cooperation between uh, domains? Well, um, these two don't but these two want to cooperate. For instance, if you have the private customer area, you want to retrieve some account details to display in a status overview or uh, I don't know what. It's an example application, so fill it in as you want, but they want to communicate or uh, interact anyway. So to deploy, um, we are gonna put this on the, the overall domain in HTTP. All the rest will be HTTPS and will have their own subdomain, except for the forum, which will become a completely different domain. So. This will, for instance, allow us to use domain relaxation or domain-based cookies here uh, without the forum having access to it. Okay, deployment-wise, um, what does this look like? Well, we have the backend, we have our four components. Well, uh, I don't really care about this part. This is more uh, Jim Manico's stuff, who will, which he will talk about in other sessions. So don't worry about this, we're worrying about this part. So it's deployed in the browser. Um, 
because they're all different origins, they're kind of isolated within the browser. So that's a good thing. Uh, you can achieve, well, leverage the same origin policy to achieve this. These parts need authentication. So we also want to deploy them over HTTPS, uh, which will, will have some consequences later on. And finally, we want some interaction from the private customer area to the account management uh, part, and how we will achieve that will uh, be dealt with later on. All right. Um, by the way, if there are any questions, I, I finished the, the first part now. If there are any questions, you can gladly raise your hand and ask them. I, I do my best to answer them. So now we have different compartments. The next step is we want to have authentication on these uh, parts without having to redo it every time. And we also want um, to exchange some information between, between the two, these two contexts. So first, authentication. Authentication on the web exists of two steps. First, you need to know who, who the user is. So that's the entity authentication part. And next, once that is done, you want to maintain a session. So um, as you all know, HTTP doesn't really uh, know which requests belong together. So we use something like session identifiers to know, OK, uh, these and these and these requests uh, belong together. And they're associated with that authentication state. So we can deal with the request appropriately. Entity authentication, I'm not really going into detail on this because it has uh, little influence on the security policies within the browser. So basically, today, you exchange a username and a password. Um, this is probably not the best practice, but the most commonly used. Um, you also have challenge response systems, like with the Belgian banks and their tokens. Uh, that's one good example. You have client-side certificates, uh, which are on your EID. So if you use that to log in on a website, you use a client-side TLS certificate. And then you have session management. Um, De facto session management is cookie based. Um, so what happens is you have a session identifier, you put it in a cookie, it's transmitted on every request and you associate a request with a session, um, which is quite important because this cookie is actually a bearer token, which means if you present the cookie to the web server, the web server is gonna assume that you're the legitimate holder of the session. So if somebody manages to steal that cookie, he can impersonate you because the web server doesn't know that it's not you. Um, so very quick, how does this work? You have a browser and server. Um, the browser sends a first request for some page on the server. Um, server seed is coming in, wants to establish a session, but doesn't really, um, well, there's no session cookie or anything, so he doesn't know who you are. So in the session store, you'll create a new session with a very random identifier. Um, how you should actually generate identifiers uh, is on the OWASP website. There's some cheat sheets with a whole list of recommendations. Here it's a uh, non-random example. And it has some uh, authentication state which is false, so no user is authenticated. The response contains a header, um, set cookie, which contains this identifier. Um, and in the browser, this will result in a cookie being stored for this domain. So um, it's a domain that belongs to the request, and uh, this is stored in the browser. So on every subsequent request, this cookie will be sent um, if the request goes to this domain. So again, request to this domain, Oh yeah, I have a cookie for that, let me attach that. Which allows the server to look it up. He doesn't really care about this page, so just a response. Um, which triggers the actual login request with a username and a password, for instance. Again, the cookie is attached, allowing the server to um, retrieve the session. He checks the username and the password. They are valid for the user Bob, so he switches the authentication state to true and the user to Bob. So every subsequent request will allow the server to look up the session, see, okay, this is Bob that authenticated, so I'm gonna do action X or Y or whatever. That's how cookie-based session management works. What is important with cookies, or what can you do to modify the behavior of cookies? There are a lot of flags, well, uh, four or five actually, that have an impact on cookie behavior. Um, the first one is the domain. So um, a domain attribute allows you to set a cookie for a parent domain. In our example, for instance, if you want a cookie to be used in all subdomains of example.com, you can set the flag for uh, the cookie to example.com. And the browser will not only send the cookie to, to www.example.com, but to um, foo or bar or accounts or private or whatever. Not to exampleforam.com. That's a different domain, so it doesn't relate here. A second attribute is the path, um, which we don't need in our application, but I'm going to cover it because it's important to realize something about the path. Um, it allows you to limit a cookie to a specific directory within a domain. So for instance, let's say you have um, 
you have user domains. Um, for instance, uh, Telenet has these uh, websites for its customers. So it's users, users.telenet.com slash uh, Jan and Bert and whatever. Um, if they have an application there, they want to set a path on their cookies because they only want the cookies to be sent to their application. Okay, seems valid. The problem is, however, that this conflicts with the same origin policy. Why? Let's say I am the attacker, uh, which lives under the user's domain, and I want to steal the cookies from uh, an application that's under the victim directory. Same domain, uh, but victim. If you send a request to the attacker, the cookies for victim will not be included. Um, why should they? They are restricted to the path. So the attacker includes an iframe and loads a page from the victim application. Seems valid. They are same origin, okay. So he can interact with this frame and he can, within the frame, he can access a document and from the document he can access the cookie attribute. Now, this is within the victim application, so the browser will return all the cookies belonging to this domain and where the path matches, matches the victim. So in this case, the attacker can successfully steal the cookies from the victim application within the limits of the same origin policy. And that's because there is a mismatch between the same origin policy, which is based on origins, and the cookie path attribute, which is based on uh, the paths of a cookie. So shortly after they introduced this uh, attribute, they added a line saying that this is not a security property and you can use it for practical purposes or to avoid conflicts in cookie names, but not as a security measure. Good. The third attribute is a fairly important one and it's called HTTP only. It's a really simple one. And what it does is it restricts a cookie from being accessed through JavaScript. So um, basically it tells the browser, you can send this cookie on every request, but if someone asks for the cookies through document.cookie, never ever return this cookie. This helps preventing session hijacking attacks where you, for instance, you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, the attacker uh, runs some script in the browser, extracts the cookie, sends it to his server and takes over your session. Well, this is prevented by this attribute because it's never available here. So any cookie you don't need in JavaScript, which are basically all cookies in most applications, should have this flag on it. Um, it requires little effort and it provides a lot of security. And then the fourth attribute is related to HTTPS and it's called the secure flag. Um, again, it's a fairly straightforward flag. If you set a cookie on an HTTPS connection and you add the secure flag, you tell the browser, only send this cookie on a secure connection. Never send it on an HTTP connection. Why is this important? Because cookies are domain-based and the browser doesn't care about the origin when attaching cookies. So HTTP and HTTPS would be different origins but are not different domains. So in this example, you have the attacker which lives on attacker.com and he wants to, um, he, it's a network attacker. So he sits on the same wireless network as you. He can sniff your uh, plain text uh, HTTP connections, but don't worry, you have HTTPS, so everything is fine. But what he does is he tricks your browser into um, sending a request to secure.example.com, which is supposed to be HTTPS, but he uses the HTTP scheme. Seems quite harmless, but if the browser has cookies for this domain without a secure flag, he will attach them to this request because they're not secure, so why, why should this matter? And this allows an attacker to steal our cookies from the network, which effectively leaks uh, cookies that should be secure um, to the network. Therefore, if you have any cookies that are used on HTTPS connections, add a secure flag. Um, again, simple, simple solution for uh, a lot of troubles that can arise. Additionally, if you have um, a mixed HTTP and HTTPS environment, um, you might figure, okay, I can't use the secure flag because I need the cookies on HTTP as well. But um, that's definitely not the right approach because if you have the HTTP connection, then the cookies will leak uh, eventually and will also compromise the HTTPS part. So the good approach here is to associ associate different security levels to different cookies. So you have a separate HTTP and a separate HTTPS session identifier, which can eventually point to the same session, but for every security sensitive operation, you require HTTPS. And if the HTTPS cookie is not present, um, which is the case with an attacker who can only steal the HTTP cookies, then you will not execute um, the sensitive operation. That's essentially how a lot of websites nowadays work. For instance, Amazon, the shopping cart is HTTP. Um, it's vulnerable, somebody can hijack your connection, can add stuff to your cart, but once you check out, once you change account details, they switch to HTTPS, and if you don't have the appropriate cookie, they just uh, ask you to relog in, and for an attacker, it's game over by then. Good, what does it mean for example.com? We have the need for cookies um, 
basically here where we want session management, so everywhere where there's authentication. For these two domains, they have the same parent domain. Um, we choose to deploy the cookie on example.com domains, so it will be sent to every example.com subdomain, but we add the secure flag and the HTTP only flag, but the secure flag will limit this to HTTPS connections, which means that the public uh, part where we don't really need a session cookie, which is not deployed over HTTPS, will not see this cookie because it's secure, marked as secure. Alternatively, if we want to share authentication with the forum, that might be a bit difficult because we can't set a cookie that applies to both. So the correct uh, approach to do there is to have a separate cookie for the forum website, but you can associate the same session with this cookie. So what you typically would do, that's how Google, for instance, does, um, does its single sign-on. If you log into Google, um, once you're authenticated, it starts sending background requests to uh, its partner websites like YouTube and whatever. And it basically says to YouTube, okay, this user is authenticated. Here's a session you can use. Um, so when the user visits you and he has this session ID, we actually know that it's associated with uh, this internal session and uh, that's the user, uh, Philip, for instance. Um, and that's, um, that's actually quite a good approach. So you can share authentication without um, sharing the session identifiers, basically. So that's for the authentication part. Now we want to see how we can um, achieve other interactions except for authentication. And the interaction um, is kind of limited um, because of the same origin policy. So what is allowed? You have related context. So you have, for instance, if you include an iframe, you can get a reference to the iframe and you can um, ask some, some things to the iframe. So if it's same origin, you can access it completely. If it's cross origin, you are very limited. Another example of a related context is if you open a pop-up, you get a reference to the window and you can, for instance, ask the window to navigate uh, to a URL or um, something like that. So one interaction that is possible is navigation. So you can ask a child frame or the, the top frame, for instance, um, if you can get a reference to the window, you can ask it to, to navigate it. So you can send it to a certain <coughs> URL. Uh, this is useful if you want um, to have some automated um, navigation somewhere, if you want to resend, well, reload a page in the pop-up. Um, and the second interaction that is possible are using exposed APIs. And this is useful for us because one of the APIs that's exposed is web messaging, and this allows interaction between frames. So the web messaging API um, is basically a mechanism that allows you to send a message to a, a window or a different context, which can choose to receive the message. It's an opt-in mechanism, so if it doesn't care about messages, it just doesn't accept messages. And um, once it processes a message, it also has a reference to the sender, so it can send the message back. Um, it's used for iframes, uh, for instance, uh, a lot. So you include an iframe and you can send messages to the iframe, regardless of its origin. But it's also used in other technologies like Web Workers, which is a background JavaScript um, thread API, so you can run background JavaScript threads and you can commu communicate with that using post message. So how does it, um, well, I'll show in a, in a second how it works. There are, however, some security considerations. Of course, you don't want to send messages to anyone. So um, they really thought this API true, and they have some steps, well, taken some steps to protect against malicious use. First, if you send a message, you tell the API, I'm going to send the message to um, private.example.com, for instance. So you specify the origin. This is important if you have an iframe and an attacker manages to navigate his iframe to his own website and then you send a message, then you leak information to the attacker, which is not what you want. So you specify the receiver, the browser checks this. If it doesn't match with what you specified, then he won't deliver the message. So you are certain that if the message is delivered, it's delivered to the right party. When you receive a message, you want to check where it came from because everybody can basically include your application and start sending messages to it. And if you accept everything, and just, um, for instance, execute requests on everybody's behalf, then things will, go, will, uh, will be going wrong. So you get an origin property, you can check. So you can check if you receive a message, oh, this came from accounts.example.com, yes, I want to accept this. Or if it came from um, evilbastard.com, no, no, I'm not, not gonna accept that. Second, if you accept it and you want to do something with it, um, it's best to check what you actually got. So for instance, if you have um, uh, an API that accepts uh, a message and creates a request based on that message, then you definitely want to be sure that you're not uh, vulnerable to any injection attacks. Uh, this is a new API and um, P 
people are looking into this kind of problem and apparently a lot of sites that deploy this API are vulnerable to injection attacks. So it's um, just history repeating basically. So if you get data using this API, check what you get and whether it's what you expect. So practically, how does this work? Sending a message is really, really simple. So you have this post message API call, you give it some data and you give the origin where you want to send this to. Um, basically, this is um, as simple as it gets. The data can be, it used to be string only, but um, they've expanded it to allow JavaScript objects as well. As long as it's clonable, uh, you should be able to send it. Um, this means you can send uh, string data, you can send a JSON object, you can send an array buffer. Um, it's, it's a fairly capable API. Receiving the message is um, a bit more code, but it's actually also really simple if you're familiar with JavaScript. So you define a function which will handle the incoming message and you add it as an event listener to the window object. So the message is the event, that's the handler, and that's about it. If you receive a message, this function is called. Step one, you check the origin where it came from to see whether it's some message you want to accept. And here we just alert the data. But this is a place where you would uh, deploy some checks uh, to see whether it's what you expect and then you can do whatever you want with the message. So one example what you can do with this. Um, let's say you want to store some data in the user's browser, but you want to remain control over who gets access to that data, uh, regardless um, of which subdomain wants to access it. So what you do is you define a storage subdomain, which is basically a component that only does storage. So it, there's no uh, interaction, there's no... Uh, no other pages, nothing. It has this, um, this data store stored within its origin in the browser. So you can choose the store you want. Uh, let's say it's IndexedDB. So it offers some way to store data. Now, every, co every component of the application that wants to store some data and wants to be able to access it later on just includes an iframe of this component and uses web messaging to ask like, okay, I want to read um, some account information for this customer. And then the storage API can decide whether um, it wants to allow this. If you are the accounts uh, application, then it can say, okay, yes, uh, you can read this and here is the data. If it's the public forum, for instance, it can say like, oh no, definitely not. Uh, you're, you have no business with the account information. I'm not allowing this. So basically uh, it allows you for content inspection and access control, uh, which you would otherwise not get, which is a nice application. So practically, um, how would we deploy this? Well, we had the need for interaction. Well, basically, we can include an iframe from the accounts part uh, in the private customer area, and we can start sending messages to it using post message, and we can get information out of it. Alternatively, we could have used uh, document.domain to relax both origins and uh, interact with them directly. But uh, as told before, that would open up the, this origin for other uh, for other contexts as well. So that's maybe not what you want. Um, that's why we chose for the web messaging part. All right, um, now we have covered um, the, the mechanics of, their own of our own application. Now we're um, gonna see how we can include external content like the analytics or the Twitter uh, code. So. Including remote content is basically as old as the web itself. So it started with images. You could include images from other websites um, and then it fastly expanded. You have JavaScript, CSS, other HTML documents in iframes or frames. You have SVG, which are images, but can also contain active script. You have audio and video elements um, in HTML5. You have plugin content like Flash and Java and you have many, many, many more. It's uh, rapidly expanding. How does this work? Well, um, content has a URL, so it also has an origin associated with it. The browser fetches it and integrates it according to the content type. So um, it basically depends on what you're fetching, what happens with it. For a script, um, a JavaScript file is typically parsed and then included in the security context of the page that includes it. Um, so this can have some security risks. The images are simply put in the page where there's a placeholder and they are displayed and that's about it. Um, Images are not active, they can't do anything wrong. And the only thing that can leak is basically the size of the image um, for the including page. That's about it. What can go wrong here or what, or what are the problems with including content? Well, we had a mixed content problem, which is when we have an HTTPS site and we want to include resources, what can exactly, exactly what can go wrong? So let's say we have a browser 
we have an HTTPS page loaded and the page includes some scripts and uh, style sheets and whatever. So what happens when the browser processes this page? He sees, okay, I need a script, um, which is an HTTP script, so I'm going to request the script and the server is going to answer with the, the file. That's yeah, straightforward, happens thousands of times um, when you're browsing. But if you have an attacker that sits on a network, he sees this request going out and he's like, okay, this is an HTTP resource for an HTTPS site. Interesting, I want to get hands on that site, so let me quickly respond with a compromised script before the server does. And the browser expects a script coming in, so he accepts the script as the valid response. By now, you have the attacker script running in your HTTPS page uh, because the browser parses it and loads it. And this is, again, um, very problematic and that's exactly why mixed content is, is such a problem and why it's also being um, handled in the modern web. So, how do you solve this? First of all, browsers are um, blocking mixed content inclusion. Um, surprisingly, uh, Internet Explorer started with this, so um, they started giving uh, pop-up warnings when you have an HTTPS site including um, HTTP content. And um, today, other browsers are following as well. So you have Internet Explorer and Mozilla is following. And what they're actually doing is they're blocking active mixed content. So um, they know if you include an image from some website that you're probably not going to be able to do it over HTTPS. But it really doesn't matter because the image can't do any, any harm. So it's just an image. But if you include JavaScript, if you include Flash, uh, Java applets, things like that, and you do it in an HTTPS site, then if you don't, use HTTPS for the resources, then you will get warnings or it will be blocked uh, by default. So this is something that's being addressed and that's also kicking developers for uh, not, not having fixed their site. So uh, you definitely don't want your user to see this warning every page he loads. So that's uh, definitely something you want to address. What can you do? Well, first of all, include HTTPS resources, but that's easy, easy said, uh, more easier said than done. So, um, you can use, oh, either you can localize these resources. So if you have this HTTPS script, the HTTP script that you really want to include, one, one solution is to just download it and put it on your own web server. Um, this, yeah, it's not the, the most, uh, well, um, gallant solution, but it solves the problem because it's script is loaded from your web server and you use HTTPS anyway. The only disadvantage is that you need to keep it up to date. So if the remote script changes, you need to uh, update your version as well. Another um, alternative is to use uh, additional uh, alternative service providers. For instance, Google. I know Google uh, caches a lot of scripts that are very popular, so you can load it from Google directly, and they offer HTTPS. So that's also uh, an additional step you can take. Okay, that's the delivery mechanism. How can you integrate this remote code? There are basically two mainstream mechanisms for integrating, um, in this case, JavaScript. Um, you either do it directly with a script tag, uh, which is very straightforward and done often, or you um, integrate it in the way of an, well, by means of an iframe uh, in a separate document. Script-based integration, um, really simple, but it actually violates the security boundaries of the, the, the web page because it's included in your security context and it makes you vulnerable for script inclusion attacks. Iframes um, can leverage the same origin policy, so if they have a different origin, then they're isolated, but um, they do preserve the security boundaries, but they, they hinder interactions. So um, there are cases where iframes are not that easy to deploy, for instance, in our example application, we had a Twitter gadget, which kind of stands alone. You can put it in an iframe, sounds good. But the analytics code um, really needs access to the page. It needs to be able to add handlers to uh, different elements to inspect what the user is doing. So putting that in an iframe will give you um, really boring analytics results. So um, it's a trade-off. And there are no real good solutions uh, available yet. So for scripts, um, it has full access to the client-side context, which is not what you want, but um, it's, yeah, you have little choice. And there are a few existing techniques to constrain scripts, um, but as a disclaimer, I kind of have to say that um, none of them are really practical at the moment, so uh, it's a difficult choice. First, you can localize them, um, which takes away the risk of having a compromised uh, service provider. Um, of course, you need to keep it up to date. There are techniques um, working with safe subset of subsets of JavaScript. For instance, AdSafe is an example, which is a language um, built, or it's a part of JavaScript you can use to define advertisements. 
Um, and if they adhere to this language, it guarantees you that they can only do what you want them to do. Um, of course, if your advertisement provider doesn't really like that, then what can you do about it? There's browser-based sandboxing. These are academic techniques, um, but they, they work really well. They allow you to enforce a security policy on a script, so it's basically an isolated module, but it requires modifications to the browser, so that's kind of a deployment nightmare. Um, Server-side rewriting, um, it requires control of the scripts because it rewrites the script. For instance, Google Kaha is an example. Um, it rewrites the script so you can um, obtain a secure module which has some security properties. But it requires rewriting, so you need control over the scripts to rewrite them. Um, and then finally, this is the most promising one, it's uh, JavaScript-based sandboxing, which basically um, sandboxes the script within the browser purely in JavaScript. So we include the sandboxing library, you include the uh, potentially dangerous script and it creates a sandbox module from it um, which can only do what a policy allows it to do. Um, this is something we're working on at KU Leuven, um, but this is, well, it's practical uh, in research, but it's not yet production ready. So but that's definitely the way it's going and the way the solution for this problem will be in this, this space. Iframe-based integration, that's the other approach. Um, as said before, they're controlled by the same origin policy. So they allow you to have some isolation to contain it nicely. Um, and they're well suited for separate components. For instance, advertisements, they typically have like this square space somewhere. Um, they're integrating them with iframes is a really straightforward solution. If they don't need access to the page, you can put it in an iframe and uh, be done with it. Um, additionally, HTML5 introduces more security controls for the iframe, um, which will probably be covered in Levenstock on Thursday. Um, and it's a sandbox attribute. And what it basically does is it, it allows you to define additional restrictions on the iframe. So for instance, if you enable the sandbox by default, the iframe is not allowed to run any scripts. It's not allowed to run any plugins. It, it's not allowed to submit forms. Um, and there's a, a whole bunch of other restrictions that are available and you can relax the restrictions one by one with keywords. So you can say, okay, I want to prevent all of this, but I want to um, allow scripts to be run. Yeah. So you can get a level of, of granularity um, for the protection that you need. Additionally, they support a unique origin. So basically you can tell the sandboxed iframe to um, reset its origin to something unique that will never occur uh, anywhere in the browser. So basically this um, completely isolates the iframe from any other document. So there's no interaction with other documents, there's no uh, origin relaxation or whatever. Um, it's stuck with what it is. So this is well suited for integration of untrusted content. For instance, in our forum, we might want to deploy this. Um, every message is user provided. It's untrusted inherently. So we can, for instance, uh, use an iframe, a sandbox iframe, and display in that iframe the message from the user. Uh, you don't see this in the layout. You can make it uh, appear very nicely, but you can disable scripts. So if the user then manages to inject uh, script inje uh, scripts past your uh, XSS filter, it's still disabled by default, so nothing can happen. Could you get rid of your XSS filter? Um, if you're really sure that you don't have any other input anywhere in the page, uh, maybe. But let's approach it as defense in depth. So it seems the, the best approach. So um, this is definitely one of the problems that is um, not really solved. So what are the best practices for integrating third-party code? If possible, put it in an iframe. Iframes have a strong separation boundary and they're good for this. So if the, the use case allows you, just put it there and uh, sandbox it if necessary. So that's one approach. If you have to include script, do it from trusted providers and be aware that these are dependencies in your uh, in your application so that you depend on the other party to um, first of all be available, um, be not compromised, um, have good scripts, not, not abuse you. For instance, if Google tomorrow decides it wants to take over all the websites, well basically 80% of websites include Google code, so um, they kind of are able to do that. And again, um, as a counter argument, if you want to use a mirror for libraries, Google has, uh, has several libraries mirrored. And another approach is if you, can, if you have really crucial applications, for instance, if you're building an, an intranet application 
where security is really important and you don't want to include outside code, uh, you can localize the code on your own web server. Um, the, the guys that did the large-scale script inclusion study also looked at uh, changes that occurred in scripts and they concluded that a weekly update schedule should be fine. So um, if you have it in your development process and once a week you check all the libraries, you check the differences, you perhaps you do a quick code review to see what changed, probably it's harmless so you can you can quickly update the libraries. So for our application, um, we now have these gadgets that need to be integrated. Well, for the analytics, we do it with a script. Um, we use Google Analytics, so we kind of hope that they're secure and they know what they're doing. Um, and there's no real alternative here because it needs access to the page. It needs to be integrated um, with the whole of the page, the whole of the dump tree, so there's little isolation we can do. And for the Twitter uh, gadgets or any other social media buttons, they are really good for this use case. You can put them in an iframe. So you just frame them um, and integrate them visually with the page and there's, uh, you don't really notice it that it's framed, but it allows you to um, put some boundaries there. Okay. Um, now we've covered this. So the, the final topic is uh, interaction between the client side code and the, the backend and especially the, the problems with cross-site request forgery and uh, other and illegitimate requests. So, interacting with remote services. Um, it's the web, so it's fairly straightforward. You have HTML elements, they interact uh, constantly. If you submit a form, it submits a request to the backend. If you load an image, it submits a request to the backend. Um, you also have JavaScript. So, um, Ajax was introduced like 10, 10 to 12 years ago, I guess. Uh, with XML HTTP request object, uh, which allows you to uh, construct requests from JavaScript, send them, receive a response, process it accordingly, um, and go along. These two uh, will be the focus of this uh, section. Uh, recently, in the past few years, uh, additional technology has been introduced. So you have WebSockets, um, which basically allows you to upgrade your HTTP connection to uh, a socket channel, so you can send uh, arbitrary information without having to adhere to the HTTP protocol. You have WebRTC, which is real-time communication for the browser. Uh, it's used for video, video calls, uh, audio calls. Um, I think somebody even implemented peer-to-peer -peer communication with it. Um, so it's uh, a lot of new protocols, um, but they're being actively developed, so uh, there's little, little useful to be said there uh, regarding to production use. What are the challenges here? Well, we have difficulty determining where a, where a request originated from. So um, that's definitely something we need to know at the server side. If you receive a request, where does this come from? Can we trust this? Is this what we expect? And we need to know whether it was intended by the user. And that's the problem behind CSERF. So you need to know, is this something that resulted from an action from the user or is this something that was created automatically by an attacker? And that's, um, that's two problems that need to be addressed here. So first, HTML-based communication. Um, you can trigger different kinds of requests. You have GET requests, uh, which are the simple requests without body, um, coming from images, scripts, uh, style sheet inclusion, things like that. And you have POST requests, which are typically coming from forms, and they, have, um, they allow you some control over the body content. So you can define some parameters, you can define the values of the parameters and play a bit with that to get a certain format if you want to. These requests are not really affected by the same origin policy. So, um, that's how the web works. You don't get access to the naked response, so the browser processes it for you and therefore determines that what, what's the worst you can do, right? Um, so it even attaches cookies to the request because otherwise the server doesn't know the state, doesn't know to associate it with the user. Um, so problems arise from this, like um, cross-site request forgery. Why? Because the cookies are implicit authentication. Uh, the server implicitly assumes if the cookie is there, it par it's part of the session, so I'll execute it as part of the session, regardless whether an attacker or is, uh, made, it, made it go out or the user made it go out. Of course, there are legitimate use cases as well. If you want to include parts of a Facebook profile in your web page, then you will typically send a GET or a POST request, which gives you the data to integrate. So um, it's a difficult trade-off. A bit more on CSERF, uh, quickly schematic of how it works. Um, you have a browser. You have a server, for example.com, which is a good one, and you have a gallery.com, which is also not uh, intendedly malicious, but it's compromised by an attacker. So you have an authenticated session. This happens all the time. Um, doesn't require you to have this site open anymore. As long as there's an active cookie in the cookie jar of the browser, this is the case. 
In another tab, other window, um, it doesn't really matter, the browser goes to a compromised image gallery. So the user wants to see some images, uh, probably of uh, funny cats on the internet. So um, he receives this page with images um, and he looks at it. But in the background, there's a C-server tag embedded. And the C-server tag, um, it can be completely invisible in an iframe, uh, so you don't even notice this. But what happens in the background is it sends a request to example.com. Um, it's specifically, specifically targeted at this site, so it uh, creates a form which has uh, as target change email, which is some script at the server side, and it has some values which eventually um, include the email address of the attacker, and they want to change the email address to the attacker. The server here, um, it's a simple, simple web server, simple application, doesn't really know about CSERF, so it just gets a request with a cookie from the user and it executes this uh, in the background. This is standard procedure on the web. The user, however, hasn't seen anything happening. So he loads the page and he continues browsing on the website and it's only a, a few days, weeks, months later that he notices that email address got changed and the account got hacked. So what can you do about this? Well, um, as Jim mentioned yesterday, a lot of frameworks are starting to build in protection against this by default, so that's a good thing. Um, if you don't have such a framework, you need to build this protection in yourself. There's, again, there's an OWASP cheat sheet about CSERF. Um, and basically, today there are two valid approaches to protecting against CSERF. There's token-based approaches and the origin header. A token-based approach basically assumes that you have a secret token, and whenever that secret token is presented again, you assume it's a valid uh, Request. So how does this work? You have a form. Um, this is now about a legitimate operation on the website. So the user legitimately wants to change his email address. So you get a form which has an action, change email or whatever. And in the form you embed a secret value. You just generated this value, you stored it in a user session, and you send it in a response to the user um, which is rendered and he sees the form. He doesn't see the secret value. Whenever the user now submits this form, the secret value will be submitted as part of the body and the server will receive this and verify this token against the stored uh, token in the user session. If this matches, then he knows that this uh, request came from the response he served to the user before and he considers this a legitimate request. Um, for the attacker, um, he cannot get hold of this token. It's essential for CSERF protection um, because of the same origin policy. So basically what happens is the request, uh, the response is served to the user's browser is parsed and rendered in a, a frame or a document or whatever. Because it's a different origin than an attacker website, the attacker cannot use JavaScript to access this frame and extract the token. He can also not generate a valid one for the user who is under attack either, because um, if we go back to this image, the attacker um, doesn't live within the user's browser, so he can contact um, this server by himself from some other host and then a token will be generated in his session, but it will not be valid in the user's session. So um, these token-based approaches are a really straightforward solution uh, towards protecting against CSERF. The only disadvantage they have is that um, you have to store it somewhere in the user session um, and have them expire probably to prevent overhead. A second approach is the origin header. Um, this is also fairly simple. What uh, this does, this is a recent proposal um, but it's implemented in most browsers. So basically a browser will include an origin header on a cross-origin request. So you receive this as a server and you can check this header um, to see where the request came from. It's basically the referrer header that uses, used to be there or is still there, but it's more privacy sensitive, so um, it shouldn't be stri stripped as much as a referrer header. So if you see this coming in, um, you see a request for change email and you check the origin header and it says attacker.com or hp-attacker.com, uh, which basically tells you, okay, this request was generated by an attacker and submitted from a user's browser, but this is not an origin I trust, so I'm not going to execute this request. Um, it, only if you see your own origin, you can accept it, or if you see the origin of one of your partner websites or uh, trusted websites, you can also accept this request. But, but you could thwart that uh, as an attacker by using Yes, of course. Um, so, yeah. You can modify this header because it's a client-side generated header. So any, anybody can generate his own origin header. So it's not intended as a server-side access control, but it's intended as a way, the browser adds, adds the header 
And within the user's browsers, the attacker doesn't have control to forge it. You so have to have a man in the middle. Yes, yes. But then again, you don't really need uh, CSERF to perform actions. Is it different from the referral header? No. Um, the only difference is that it contains less information. So the refer header contains the full path and parameters and whatever. This doesn't, only the origin. And um, it's the same as a refer header in a sense that it has the same purpose or same information. But the refer header is often stripped because it contains personal information. It contains like um, what file you were looking at and what parameters it contains. And therefore, they introduce this header um, in the hope that it's not going to be stripped by uh, anonymizing proxies and things like that. So it's actually the same control. And people used to use the refer header as a CSERF protection mechanism uh, a lot of years ago. But due to continuous stripping and some uh, forging problems, um, it was discouraged as a CSERF control. But in a, in a sense, it's the same. OK, so far for HTML interaction, which was the simple one. Now we're going to JavaScript-based interaction. So uh, probably all of you know XML, XML HTTP request, which is the API for remote interaction. Um, it supports different kinds of requests. So you can uh, generate get, post, put, delete, um, anything you can imagine. You can even use your custom uh, methods. It allows you to have custom headers um, in the request, so you can use your own application-specific headers. It allows a fairly free body format, so you, you're not restricted to the, the form uh, value, key value format anymore. And um, you can have it synchronously, asynchronously, and one of the important uses is you can use APIs. You can use JSON APIs. So in the background, you request some data from the server, it gives you some JSON data, you parse it, and you present it. Um, that's basically the AJAX design principle, and it allows you to have single page applications and all that stuff. So it's a really good uh, invention. And how it works is basically, you have some URL where you want to send a request to, you create a new request with this uh, constructor, you say what method it is and where it has to go through, go to, um, you define a function that handles the response when it comes back, and you basically send the request, and the browser takes care of the rest. So the browser makes the request, uh, gets a response back, and hands you the response uh, to, to process in the onload function. So there you can inspect it. You can, um, if it's HTML, you have to inject it yourself in an inner HTML element or something. If it's JSON, you can use the JSON API to parse it. Um, if it's XML, you can do whatever with it. Uh, basically, you're free to do what you want. How does this work with the same origin policy? Well, um, it doesn't. <laughs> so basically, XHR used to be same origin only. So uh, it was a kind of security measure. You don't want to be able to construct arbitrary requests on the internet um, outside of what the HTML elements can do. So <coughs> they limited it, to, limited it to be same origin. Within the origin, you can do whatever you want. So you can use custom headers. You can use uh, cookies, which are added automatically. Um, so they expanded this. Yeah, so they expanded this to cross-origin requests because a lot of people actually were asking for this functionality. They want to be able to use a Google API to request some JSON data. They want to be able to use other cross-origin APIs or anything. And it used to be only possible with some dirty hacks that were uh, found by accident and not intended to be used. The problem, however, is that legacy server code does not expect such requests. Um, so for instance, um, XHR, going cross-origin, allows you to make uh, a cross-origin put request. But if you have an API that accepts put requests or delete requests, it implicitly assumes that it can only come from your, your own origin. And if you suddenly start accepting it from everywhere, then uh, you're going to be in big trouble uh, fairly soon. One example is Facebook. They actually had this problem. They had some code um, on the mobile version, if I'm not mistaken, that accepted uh, a document, a URL, and loaded it using XHR. Um, they did it assuming that it's same origin, so what's the worst that can happen? An attacker can load a different Facebook page. Oh, not really a problem, one might think. But if you have cross-origin requests, then all of a sudden you can include any page you want, and it's rendered within the facebook.com origin, and uh, it allows you to do a lot of nasty stuff. So this is exactly one of the examples that uh, you need to take care of, and what the developers of this API effectively took into account. So. Um, it's the cross-origin resource sharing, or course for short, API. And what it basically does is it uh, implements or proposes a mechanism of using headers uh, to enforce some 
controls to be able to, uh, that you don't provide additional capabilities to an attacker. So an attacker already has the traditional HTML capabilities, um, so it can, he can send uh, get and post requests, but uh, with the introduction of this API, he should not be able to do more. Um, so that's really important. They assume that websites existing now already take into account this, uh, this problem or these capabilities, which may not be the case, but uh, that's the case they assume. So let's not give them more with this API. And that's, that explains a lot of the design decisions in this API. So how does this work? You make an XHR request from the client side. Um, this is basically, oh, this is the next slide. Um, this is basically the same as before, except um, the browser will do some additional things in the background. Um, the goal of this API is that the server, when he processes your request, first he decides whether he wants to or not, and then he tells the browser how to proceed with the response. So he gives a response, and if it comes from an untrusted origin, he tells the browser like, okay, um, I really don't like this, so please don't give them access to my response. Uh, in this case, if an attacker succeeds in making a request that was not allowed, he will not be able to access the response, he will not be able to uh, extract CSERF tokens or whatever. Um, so they really want to prevent additional attack factors um, and they either use the policy I described before or they use a pre-flight request. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about pre-flights, but basically um, they allow normal requests that look like HTML requests to happen and prevent access to the response. But for really complicated ones like a put you re or a delete request, you really don't want to execute it first and then tell the browser, oh yeah, I, I don't want the, the attacker to have access to the response because you already deleted some file. So therefore, they first they send a pre-flight, which checks with the server, is it okay if I send this delete request coming from here? And if the server says yes, you can do that, then the browser executes it. The developer doesn't notice this. It happens in the background, um, and it's completely invisible. This API was created for use with uh, XHR, but it's already used in other APIs as well. So. Um, you can, when a resource is loaded cross-origin, regardless of XHR or not, you can add these headers and uh, the browser will take them into account for certain technologies. For instance, you have a HTML5 canvas element, um, which becomes security sensitive when it contains an uh, image loaded from another origin. And with the course headers, you can relax uh, the restrictions imposed there. But I'm not going into detail on that. So how does course work? Sending the request is basically exactly the same as before. One modification, you, can, uh, you have to explicitly ask to use credentials if you want that. Um, so that's basically one, one attribute added. If you don't want that, okay, that's a, that's a typo that should be right here. Uh, if you don't want that, um, you don't have to add it, so it's fine. What happens in the response? So this is for a simple request. Let's say um, you request some API information. The server fetches that information sends it back, and then adds some course response headers. So it says, allow origin. If this uh, string here doesn't match the origin that effectively asked for the data, the browser will automatically deny access to response. So you'll never see the data from the API. Um, if credentials need to be used for that API, the server will um, tell the browser whether uh, credentials <coughs> are allowed to be used or not. And if um, this doesn't match with the use of credentials, um, it's again denied. And if you use custom headers, so if the application uses custom header, um, you can allow the script that receives a response to access this header. By default, it can only access some um, default headers that are not security sensitive. But since it doesn't know whether your headers are security sensitive or not, you have explicitly approved access to these headers. So uh, a practical example of sharing an API with course. How, how would you do that? Um, well, first the checklist here. Um, if you receive a request on the server side, you have to check the origin of the request. That's where the origin header I talked about with CSERF comes into play again, so it's reused. And if this origin matches something you want to allow, then okay, you can proceed. You can check the, met oh, you can check the method that's used. Um, if this is a GET request and the API allows GET requests, okay, fine. <coughs> This is also the moment you want to perform some access control if necessary. If you want to um, prevent certain people from accessing it and there are credentials, you can do it here. You can execute it and then um, when creating the response, you add the appropriate response header. So you either add the header saying, okay, this origin is allowed to access it or you add the header, this origin is not allowed to access it. Um, so 
This is an API um, we will allow course access to, which is public. So basically, um, we don't require credentials and everybody can access this information. Let's call it the, the public information registry or whatever. So we can even allow a wildcard origin. You can tell the browser, okay, any origin is fine. I don't care. Um, let them access this. This is typically done for public files or public JavaScript uh, things that are, that are allowed to be accessed from anywhere. Second example is a restricted course API. For instance, uh, for our accounts part of the website. What you want to do here is um, we only want to allow the, the customer area origin. So uh, we want to prevent all other access. We want to allow the use of credentials and we have an X version that tells the, the client side script which version of the API is uh, returning the response. And um, we want to expose that header. So we add allow origin, the HTTPS part of private.example.com. Uh, we allow the use of credentials and we expose the X version header um, to the client side script so it can use the xhr.get response headers uh, X version to inspect this, this header. Um, I'm not aware of framework support currently. I haven't checked um, this recently, but I think that a lot of frameworks already support course uh, through some XML configuration. So you can, you can add this in an XML file and you don't have to add headers yourself. <coughs> okay, so um, in our application, what does this mean or how does this work? We want interaction from this origin to the accounts part. Um, we used to do it with an iframe uh, through the client side component, but now we can uh, directly contact the, the public, the, the accounts API on the backend. So uh, using course, we are able to, to do it like this um, uh, without having to include a client side component and using post message to ask information there. Okay, so I basically covered all the, the challenges in my previous slide. Uh, I'm going to quickly wrap up what we've seen. So first of all, um, if you remember something from the session, what should it be? Um, the origin is a core concept in web security. So design your application around origins. Take that into account. Be aware that the origin um, doesn't not, not only represents the, the URL and the HTTP and HTTPS, but also that it's used within the browser for security decisions. So if you have storage, data storage within the browser, it's limited per origin. If you have, uh, you can create file systems within origins within the browser. You can, um, if if an API requests permissions, for instance, to share your location, it's typically done based on an origin. So this origin is really valuable and used for a lot of security decisions. So um, be very aware that this is important concept. If you compartmentalize your application, you basically introduce natural barriers. So you prevent escalation if one part is compromised. You um, give yourself the flexibility to be able to define cookies for a specific, or, uh, specific domain in this case, or to use storage only in a specific origin. Um, so this is also um, well, good practice of, of thinking about this when building a web application. Then it's a really, really old advice, but still really uh, applicable. Treat incoming messages as uh, potentially untrustworthy. Um, so basically this, this holds for everywhere. This holds for um, things you get at the server side. Requests basically. This holds for things you get from a post message at the client side. This holds for data you get from uh, a local data store. Who knows which script might have modified your data? So if you trust it blindly, you're vulnerable to even persistent uh, XSS injections. Also at the server side, SQL injection, um, that's also a problem of, of this, this statement. And then finally, be aware of the external parties you trust. Be aware of um, the trust relationship, um, of which scripts you include. Um, think about whether you want to do this or not. Um, investigate how trustworthy is this partner. Uh, have they been compromised before? Um, things like that. First step is being aware that you at least trust these external parties and then you can start thinking about um, can I accept this or not or how can I mitigate the risk. For those of you interested, um, we have the deliverable I mentioned before for the Struce project is online on the project's website. Um, so it's a, a general overview of web security. Um, it covers a lot of these topics I, I talked about today, so that's definitely a good read. Um, if you want to know more about the browser security policies, you have the book The Tangled Web from uh, Michal Zalewski, it's a Google guy. He has the browser security handbook, uh, which is a wiki online, maybe you know of it. Um, it describes these policies in a lot of detail, so basically um, he covers 
um, the essence, starting from HTML, and then he talks about how different browsers include different scripts. Um, it can be really technical sometimes, um, but after the book you will know uh, all the quirks and all the, the weird decisions that have been made when creating the web. And then finally, um, The Death of the Internet is um, a book that looks forward about how things can go wrong. Um, this is a, well, not an easy read, so um, be aware when you start on it. Um, but it discusses the motives of attackers. So it, it goes into detail about why would uh, someone want to compromise an advertisement uh, server? How can they gain money with it? Um, what's their incentive? Um, and they also discuss potential defenses, of course. But uh, this is a lot, lot more technical than the others. Okay, so that's basically all I had uh, for today. Um, I don't know if you have any questions, which I might be able to answer. Yeah. Yes, so it's a request header. So basically, um, if you generate a request from the browser, you cannot spoof it. So the browser prevents uh, any API from specifying an origin header. Um, but if you just write a whatever script, a Perl script that generates an HTTP request, then you can, of course, set your own values. So you should never use it for access control, but you use it um, to determine whether you want at least look at the request or not. But the problem, well, it's used for CSERF protection. The problem, problem with CSERF is that in a CSERF attack, the cookie of the user is used to send the request. And that's typically um, not possible in when you have a script that you generate your own HTTP request because you don't have the cookie of the user. Well, if you have that, then it's game over anyway, mostly. Yeah, that's actually a good good comment because the refer header um, when going from HTTPS to HTTP it was omitted by default because. HTTPS is considered security sensitive, um, so they don't want to leak any information about it. So they just left out the refer header, which is not practical if you use it as defense. So this should be more robust. Um, if you're really interested, there's a specification, an internet draft about it, I guess. You can check out. Um. So in that context for CSR defense, you would rather recommend to use the original rather than the token based approach? You can use them both. They're both valid defenses, um, but the origin header might have less less overhead. Um, so yeah. They also have to check how many browsers are actually using the origin header. It could be that some of the mobile browsers do not get implemented, and in that case, it might be better. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. A good website for that. Yeah, there's a website, uh, canIuse.com, um, and it basically lists all the new new features coming up in in web in the web and it also lists the support of all browsers. So basically for every feature you have like this overview table with green and red and you can quickly spot, okay, is this supported or not? I suspect that the origin header is well supported probably. And yeah, another one. Yeah. There was another header that you could use which is the X, uh, X frame option I think to not allow your content to be yeah. included in a, in a frame. Yeah. Do you think that's a valid defense for the first? Yes, the X-Frame options header, um, I guess Levin will cover that on Thursday in more detail, but it cannot be used as a defense against including third-party scripts, but it can used, be used to defend your site from being included by an attacker. Um, so it prevents attacks like clickjacking um, and things like that. But um, it does not offer any protection against including a, a third-party script because, yeah, the script can set that, but then it, the malicious script cannot be included uh, in an iframe or something like that. So that's not really useful. Um, so but it's as a protection measure for your own website. Well, those staggering marks, for instance, you said at the beginning that the people are saying, well, for instance, for Twitter, we can use a frame instead of using a script to be included. But most of the AI files will not offer you just an iframe to be included as well. So in that sense, most probably you will actually make your own frame and use these scripts in that frame, but then you decide on which domain or if it's a sandbox that you're including in your own website. So that typically will still offer you just an API, a JavaScript API to be included, 
but then you build your own frame around it and make sure that it's separated from the rest of your application. Okay, no more questions? Well, if you think of any, I'm still here the rest of the week, so you can grab me during any break or lunch. Okay, thank you.